Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our second speaker is Dr. Woody Davis. Uh, Woody is an attorney physician with 30 years plus of military and government experience. He's currently a consultant advisor with the Center for Naval Analysis in Arlington. Formerly he was with the University of Texas, Austin and the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Aviation Administration in DC. Uh, when he's not doing all of that, <laughs> that other stuff, he's an avid volunteer astronomer and science instructor for the U.S. Naval Observatory, the Smithsonian, University of Texas McDonnell Observatory, and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Woody is going to talk to us about last year's big event, which you may have heard about, the Great Eclipse of 2017. Yep. Uh, so take it away, Woody. Thank you, David. So, and I'm also a NOVAC member, <laughs> so in case that uh, had nothing else to do. And um, the presentation I'm going to give you tonight is really a lot about not so much the public part of what the uh, eclipse occurred, since I know most of y'all were very much following with it, but some of the stuff that has been going on um, both before and after, because I thought it'd be a lot more interesting to folks that are associated with amateur astronomy, as well as some of the stuff that's going on with the JPL world as well. So we don't have a whole lot of people, but please ask questions as we go along. Um, Solar System Ambassadors um, are the educational outreach program for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the 12 NASA centers. And uh, my wife and I, Dory, sitting, decided to sit in the back since I, I normally she's my she's my changer, and uh, but tonight she, I have the magic here, so I don't need it. <laughs> and, um, and her mother, who's 97, is visiting with us also tonight, as well as her uh, um, as the lady the lady that looks like 70 that's sitting there next to her, and uh, uh, her uh, friend. Um, Elizabeth and little Dalton at two. So we have quite a turnout here from our family tonight. And and the other thing I was going to say, this program has turned out to be a little bit shorter than I had hoped because I had, last sat Saturday we did Sky Meadows. Last night we did the Naval Academy. And so my, my ambitions were somewhat restricted after I realized how many programs I had in such a short order. But I think you'll enjoy this. Of course, at the, this is the one I start off with a lot of other folks. Please come join us. We're, Got a bunch of little ones here. So maybe we'll ask y'all, what, what do you think you're looking at up there on the screen? The what? Sun? Solar eclipse? Okay, well it's actually a really neat one because this is the totality. And actually you've got things here that you can see on this particular picture. Because not only you got all that corona, you've got some, here you've got some, some uh, loops coming out of there that you can also see as well. So yes, that's a kind of a tough picture to see because you've got to be in the right place at the right time. So the Washington area at 2.42 p.m on the 21st of August when this happened was not really totality. So we didn't get all the neat stuff that normally comes when you have a, a, a total solar eclipse. But what you did if you were in Charleston, South Carolina, you would get to see the world come out because you would have not only this, um, um, you would have it very dark and all the animals thinking it's, not, it's nighttime, but a whole bunch of planets, four, four planets came out. And it's a, good, it's a good time to point out that uh, this is always happening if we do put up something to block the sun. And those are the four planets. And also you notice it also was eclipsing some of the stars actually when it was doing it, which is what I'm going to talk about here in a minute about the Eddington experiment. So this is simply what's happening. I think all of the, the young ones in the back and most of the adults know what, what's really happening. So it's really when the moon gets between the earth and the sun and gives us that nice little dance on the, on the surface. And the full shadow is the really narrow 70 mile area that we had on this particular eclipse. Um, most of us were in the partial shadow, which is the more common place to be. The one thing this, this diagram doesn't really s show you is the fact the moon is a little offset from the Earth's orbit. So actually most of the time, you may have noticed and you heard seeing in the news, these things tend to always be up or low, up to be at the, in the polar regions because there's an offset of the way the moon, the moon orbit is relationship by about five degrees to the Earth's orbit. And it changes actually over long periods of time. But that's why right now, the, like the last one we just had, we had one in, uh, 2018 was just a partial for the North for North America, but several of the others have been both up in the North and South Pole area. 
But what I really want to talk about tonight is a couple of different studies that we've been, that, so there's two things here. The universal learning is part of JPL. The, um, the, and these people are all folks that contribute to that and they're all going to give, give, give us some information about this little discussion which I wasn't sure how many young ones we we're going to have but it makes, the, it makes it easy. So as you know, general relativity, Einstein, made the changes to Newton's ideas about how the world, how the universe actually is put together, and that's the connection between mass and space. This picture is a little bit better because you can see we have this nice flat space I'm standing on, but in reality, the sun makes this big change in time space. Neutron stars do more, black holes do even more. At least that's our theory that there is space time curvature, and that space time curvature is really important because it affects. The reality is the way reason we orbit the sun is because of that curvature. You have the earth orbiting the sun because of that curvature is, is, an, is the Einsteinian approach to things. And the question that came up and would have been discussed for a long time and the whole thing we're going to talk about here for a minute is the, the, the light deflection. Because in reality, if you have all of that gravity that is, that is causing a deflection of light as it approaches from an observer's position, the next picture will get a little bit better, you ought to see a deviation. You ought to see about 1.75 seconds of arc change between which the star you're looking at from the Earth caused by the Sun. And that was believed to occur, had never really been proved, but made Einstein a rock star because in 1919, right after World War I, um, Eddington on behalf, uh, um, which was a, a leading uh, British scientist at the time, um, got along to where the arc was, which was actually one of these ones that ran in the center right over the Atlantic and pretty much over the, uh, the equator, and they got several different observations but the bottom line of the observation was they could show that there was they thought about 1.8 or 1.9 but there clearly was gravitational lensing occurring during the eclipse the light was being changed by the gravity of the star by the Sun in this case so it there's the actual positions this is what is happening during during the eclipse is they were having a change in the location as observed. So it demonstrates, among other things, Einstein's theories, but it also is a big thing about how we can look at the universe, at the galaxy in the universe. So they, like I said, they went out to various locations. Oh, 1.98, 1.6 were reported. And so it was the first experimental confirmation of Einstein. So Einstein went from a guy that wrote in the patent office to being a really big star because now he had, he had basically updated Newton to, uh, to Newton's theories to a, whole new, and it's, uh, to a whole new world, and we're still living in that world. In 1922, it was reconfirmed uh, by, the, by Wall, who went out to uh, uh, Australia and, again, could see the changes that were predicted did, were occurring. And that's kind of a better way of looking at what's happening. So you got a galaxy, there's the Earth, and all those different objects are basically causing lensing or changes in, appear in appearance as it goes around those very large, massive objects. And another little way of doing it. So we want to take advantage of this to learn more about both the both the um, universe as well as the, even the the, the near near galaxy that we live in. And this is just different ways of how it's how it represents itself when you look at the sky when you look out into through a telescope, special type telescopes, you see all of this these this is actually called an Einstein cross because it actually splits a single galaxy into four views. And this one gives a little bit more of an arc, and this one gives a whole bunch of galaxies that are actually being seen in multiple views, even though there's a smaller number of them. This is a neat picture and kind of shows it. <laughs> And so is how, again, the gravity is causing the view to change. And it's reproducible over and over and over again. And that's another, another view of, the object, of an object that's, again, be pulling. This is actually going into dark skies, dark, um, going into cosmology, into dark matter. But again, uh, this is something that's being used all the time now to be able to calculate di not only distances, but what is actually out there, because it gives you a variety of ways to look at something that we wouldn't have had otherwise without this rather significant observation. And this is another, pre I thought was kind of a neat way of looking at it. This is the gravitational peaks that are effectively occurring, and the light is going up and down and moving between those peaks as it's coming toward us. And now we're really into looking at this stuff for dark matter. Because again, when you look at these objects 
and you start looking at how the gravitational changes are occurring, you see a whole different world. And that's, that's what we've been doing more of. So this lady is a JPL person that wrote this program. And so what they did was, let's repeat the 1919 eclipse. Let's see what can we can do to, to demonstrate this is really happening. So basically, astrometrics, astrometrics, and astrome astronomy, astrometry is where we look at where things are in the sky. And the question is, can we always find them months later? And so by using astrometric uh, observations, it's really important. That's the way we build all of our, sky, our star charts. Um, this, this is a way of uh, being able to start, have a starting point to see where things are and see how much effect the gravitational effects are seen. So in 1919, as I said, there was a deflection of about 1.74 um, predicted. Uh, Eddington measured less. Actually, the other guy in Brazil measured more, um, but it didn't make him famous. In 1973, it was tried again. And at that time, they sent a bunch of people uh, and used glass plates and, and saw about 11%. And so for this one, we did it again. And actually did it again supporting folks who are amateur astronomers. It was a kind of a double thing going on with this. And, and in this case, they were, this was the plan to see what, how much they could get. And in the end, what you're doing is you're looking at two different reference fields, but then seeing where the change is occurring around the eclipse. And they did it with stuff that's very similar to some of the stuff that's sitting out here. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and so Don Burns is the person who's, who's done a lot of this work and written a lot of the papers associated with this. And it was pretty neat because they were able to, to demonstrate it and get within 3%. There was a whole lot more little detail that I took out because I, I figured I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be here, but they got within 3% of it this time. So it's been duplicated over and over again that, that Indeed, light traveling in a straight line can be changed by the gravitational effects of a large mass, and that's that's what we're seeing. And um, so, we're, let's how else can we use this information? And the important, important, and exciting stuff is let's go find exoplanets, exoplanets. So, an eclipse can also let us study coronas, and that's what we were doing: is studying the corona, among other things, as well as seeing that that devi deviation as predicted as shown in the Eddington experiment. So. Chronographs, chronographs, eclipse, create artificial eclipses, and there's been this has been around for a while. And actually, one of the original, one of the early ones uh, that was taken showed a exoplanet, and this was on an eight-meter Gemini telescope that was that was used. And so this is another approach that's being done to try to find exoplanets by blocking out the corona of the uh, of its star. Because we're trying to find another Earth, of course, and it's actually kind of diff there's ten different ways really currently right now to go out and try to find a star, try to find an exoplanet around a star. But one of the ways it's now being worked and being supported by JPL is trying to figure out a way to use take the corona out of the picture and see what we can find because the corona also tells us a lot about the t the character of the star, the t temperature, and whether or not this is going to work out. And it's challenging because just the entire device itself gives you error. And this is just an example of that error. You know, you, you see a lot more weirdness going on just because of the way the telescopes are designed. And it's tough. You're looking at a fire, you're trying to find an object next to a, to a very bright other object, a firefly and a spotlight is, is what they are saying. So seeing an Earth-like exoplanet in a habitable zone around a sun-like star is like seeing a firefly near 1,000 spotlights. But if we take this out of the equation, then it is a little bit easier to see. The Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope um, was another, uh, another JPL supported activity that again gave us some of these and chronographs are still being, coronographs are still being used to be able to t find exoplanets. And the next one they're trying to pr project is putting one out in space with a giant occulter that would take out the, st the stars in the distance and be able to look around it and be able to see uh, the, just see the planets around it. And that would be in, in working with various other devices, including the one we're going to talk about here in just a second. So the pale blue dot, of course, that's a neat one that was taken by Voyager. That's a more current one. That's Saturn, uh, from Saturn taking a picture of Earth and the Moon. So we were a very small dot out there, and we're looking for similar dots. And they're very hard to find, and so we're using various technologies to get there. 
So TEST was launched this week, and hopefully some of you know that. So TEST is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite going off on a Falcon 9. And this is really a big advance on Kepler. So Kepler's the mission that's gotten all the news. Kepler's found nearly 6,000 objects, of which at least 3,000 of them are probably exoplanets, at least have been val validated as exoplanets. This one's going to be different. This one's going to be an elliptical orbit around the Earth. And rather than looking at a small area about the size of my thumb at the end of, of, the, of the Ursa Major, it's going to look at uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the of the sky and actually try to do a survey with those four big telescopes trying to find better targets for hopefully things like James E. West when he gets up there but also there are already other things up there but it's designed to give us a whole better idea because people are very surprised that you can look at an area again the size of my thumb and find thousands and thousands of exoplanets okay there's a giant sky out there yep how many planets are out there well when we started this a long time ago, we used to talk about 100 million stars in the um, 100 million odd stars in the uh, Milky Way. Well, this is supposed to look at somewhere in the vicinity of 2 billion stars, which is right now estimated to be on the order of not even 30, more than 30 or 40 percent of the stars that are in the Milky Way and the Milky Way galaxy. So what we're talking about is we have a lot more stars now. We think there's billions and billions of stars in a, in a, in a universe of trillions and trillions of galaxies. And somebody was asking me last night at the Naval Academy, so, so is there more stars or planets? I said, yes, there are more galaxies than there are anything else. And actually, there are more gal galactic structures. And that seems to be perhaps the real foundation of our uh, entire universal st universe structure is galaxies that are built into galactic uh, clusters themselves, and so the and we're still trying to figure that out. You know, it's being being the ant looking up is that we start with what we got: planets, stars, and keep working out. But it looks like the structures are getting bigger and bigger as we go along. So the, um, uh, like I said, that, that Falcon 9 launch uh, uh, was a pretty neat one because it was their 24th time they actually recovered the first stage and now they're going to take a shot at the second stage, I understand. But uh, JPL, oh, so let me do one more. So there, J there is a NASA site that has a huge amount of neat pictures and stuff. I just grabbed a few here for this, for this activity today. Um, I was going to talk about Sky Meadows for a second. So the, the, one of the you know, neat things about, like I said, this is insight from opportunity. By having the opportunity to pay attention to what's going on around us by having that event occur, by having a totality and being able to get under it, lots and lots of stuff is being able to be able to derive from it. We, ha we have a mega, f mega film, which I could never get to work on my computer, which showed from a variety of different places, and it's on that site, of all of the different people that were involved in the eclipse and lots of things that they saw. It's a real mixed, both uh, astronomy, stargazing, people, people watching type fit picture, but it's also kind of kind of encapsulates all the different things that were going on in the solar eclipse. But Artificial solar eclipses are really, again, one of the ways that affect tests is, is going to work because they're looking for objects going in front of stars as its primary w means of making detection. Is when an object goes in front of a star, kind of reverse it a little bit, we'll be able to see that star uh, get dimmer and we'll be able to go looking for it. Because again, as we were discussing just last night, we still live in a world in which if things don't make light or reflect light, we don't really see anything. I mean, we, that's the, the, the whole conversation about the Kuiper Belt is that they don't, a lot of it out there doesn't reflect light very well at the distances that we're at. And so we're still discovering it and there's a lot of things out there to still find. Um, the, um, so anyway, so, so we also do this at Sky Meadows. I was going to, again, encourage folks at Novak or any of you who are not from Novak. Sky Meadows State Park is on the other side of 66. We do a program every month and uh, do a sky, uh, do both a junior ob astronomer observ observing as well as we take a look at um, uh, what's going on in JPL, and then we also do stargazing um, with what when we've been running about five to six telescopes. Want to just mention in passing the Lyrids are tomorrow or are occurring now in one sense, but the high point is supposed to be 5 a.m. tomorrow, so something else to be looking up in the sky. The Lyrids, of course, are. Um, a uh, comet uh, Thatcher that laid down the material. We go through it in our orbit uh, pretty, pretty much annually and all that material on occasion can be really exciting. They get 20 to 40 meteors 
uh, at night has been reported. In 2040, it's supposed to be a burst up here in some of the thicker area. We'll probably get back through it. They call it the Lyrids because it comes out of the constellation Lyra, sort of, kind of. It's actually closer to Hercules, but that, that isn't what happened when they named it. There's what a radiant looks like. So that's supposed to be tomorrow morning, but I was going to encourage any of you that are up really today, tomorrow, Monday, uh, there'll be an opportunity to, to look west. I mean, look east. I'm pointing east and saying west, east. And generally, that's the direction where most of them, uh, both that's where Lyra and Hercules will be, but also that's where you're going to be seeing things originate, uh, sort of, kind of. We actually get hit by, this is gentleman's out here doing the meteor, um, radio astronomy and meters. We get hit by 10 to 20,000 meteor meteorites from a sand of grain up to the size of a house every day. Uh, people don't appreciate that. If you're on the International Space Station, you do, because you get to look down and see them. So this is going on all the time. And a lot of them, um, people just don't think, think, well, it just comes occasionally. No, um, it's actually happening all the time. These are just sort of um, increases in the activity is more to the point. And when we do our program at Sky Meadows, we frequently, I will say something like, we should look for meteorites, uh, uh, meteors, excuse me, shooting stars. And about that time, something will happen, strangely enough, and other nights, nothing. So, but there are a lot of them up there to look at. And statistically, looking east in the early morning is the higher probability of doing it. And um, Sky Meadows is starting a program to try to do that uh, this coming Sunday morning to take a look at uh, meteor showers, uh, starting with the Lyrids. And um, so that's pretty much what, what I was going to try to touch on today. There's a whole world of stuff at that website I was telling you about. Uh, JPL does a, num a number of programs. We just did the STEM program this past uh, two weeks ago out there in support of uh, STEM at the, at the um, convention center. So there, and I, I bring that up for all these folks here who I think they sometimes have to do science projects. NASA always has with every program science projects. So there's always science projects that are associated with every single program. So TESS will have an education section with a whole bunch of education already worked out from kindergarten to college. So you can go there and, and it gives you some ideas and maybe even some, some help. I don't get any questions. Yes, sir. Can you Talk a little bit about the James Webb telescope when it might when it's actually supposed to launch. And yeah. Does JPL have anything to do with that? Yeah. So yes, 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 and sort of. Um, so, um, so yes. So, so James, I've got, almost gotten tired of talking about it since at least 2011 that it would be next year. For a while this year, I was saying next year. So it's not next year now. Somewhat of his budget, somewhat of his budget. Some of it is really testing that has continued to stretch on further and further. So it's a fairly complicated piece of equipment, and they really want to make sure that it gets out there and works, because it's, there's no fixing this. This is not the Hubble. We're not going up there to fix it, because it's, it's going to be at, at the launch two uh, point, and your ability to get there is not in our current technology. You can get it there, but you can't go visit it, not very, very readily. A quarter of a million miles. And so it's not going to readily be visited by anybody. So it works or it's going to be bad news. And the sunshade opening and shutting is what they've been trying to test. They were testing it down in, at the um, Johnson Space Flight Center and trying to make sure that it, it worked. And they had a hurricane come through when that happened. That kind of screwed up their, their plans. And the... Um, to get it, uh, strangely, they're actually going to barge it to to the French Guiana launch site at ESA out of the west coast, and that's also part of the part of they're going to test it some more over at JPL is having a part of the, the testing there, and then they're going to ship it after flying it to Johnson. They're going to barge it to to French Guiana. So some of this is money, some of it is, but they they're way over budget, way past time. I mean, I can say people are doing the best they can to get this thing in the air or in the spa into space, but it's been um, it's very technologically demanding. They they were very aggressive when they built it. It can do a lot of things in the infrared. We had a, I had a program on it about five years ago. I quit talking about it because it wasn't it just because it kept sliding to it. So anything that goes out of space, uh, goes out of uh, Earth orbit, JPL provides navigation and provides the deep space network communications. So they are directly involved in being able to make sure the thing will talk back and communicate and be under control, as well as to make sure it actually gets to where it's pointing. It's going up on an Iran-5, a big um, European rocket. That's their contribution to it, and they're going to launch it from down in, in, Euro uh, down in French Guiana. 
Some of the delay is also because the schedule keeps changing there, and they keep launching down there. They have other customers, so they they have to get get they keep losing their spot. Some of that, some of it is, but part of it's money. Part of it is they they're over their budget, and um, and they're trying to they're trying to trying to get it there. Other people keep launching other devices. Um, the Europeans have launched several things. Plank, Plank, and uh, Herschel have both gone up to give them ability to look at uh, um, uh, exoplanets to a degree. Other people have got other ideas in mind. So it's it, you know, it's it would have been great if they'd launched in 2011 like they planned. <laughs> but should, should it be an incredible advance in looking? So the so the, the the testimony to the hill is, with this, in the infrared, you ought to be able to see objects the size of Earth around another star. So the theory is you ought to be able to have direct direct. Right now, when you we're really inferring a lot of these planets. We're inferring we don't have a direct vision of them because we, they're too small and they're too far. You know the objects are, are the resolution is just not there with anything we really have. So when you do a lot of this exoplanet stuff, you're doing it by what they do, how they pull the star, how they look like when they go across the star, how they look like in various various um, um, how they affect each other in their orbits. So there's a lot of inference going on. This would be a direct observation of events, and it's uh, it, you actually would have a uh, something you can nearly see if it's really close. You know the nearest one, the near the nearest uh, star system, the Proxima system. We we pretty sure has planets around it. We ought to be able to see that with fairly easily. And so there will be your first exoplanet. You can put a picture up and show it on the New York Times. So that's that's their big song and dance. Yes, sir. Uh, I read uh, about uh, the test uh, satellite. Yeah. And it made it sound like its detection is really going to be of larger size. It's more like uh, Jupiter or Neptune by the, the difference. But it, it, we can then point other things at those particular yeah. devices. So we think, that as, as you're saying, actually, what what but Kepler has found, which gets everybody sort of scratching their heads, most objects appear to be um, small sized Neptunes or maybe large sized Earths, depending on you want to look at either a big rock or a small gas. They don't seem to be anywhere near the size of us. They did tell the Hill that we could do that. In our likelihood is what he's saying is what we'll find, because so far that's what we found. But at least the opportunity is there. This will be a much have much uh, greater re uh, potential. It's not really resolution because you're not really. It's not optics. It's it's really having the ability to find something that's much smaller and be able to characterize it uh, would probably be a better way to say it. But they're trying to keep the money going. <laughs> so there. So, so it's uh, and because you can be you you can be able to. And, and, in, and in theory, you can see the atmospheres much better and be able to characterize those atmospheres, see how much water is in those atmospheres, and blah, blah, blah. That's what they're telling. That's the, that's the official line about why you want to keep doing this. And we have a huge amount of money invested in it, and, and they want to get it up there and give it a chance, billions and billions to get it. And, and, and what, what gets lost in the conversation, so they spent this money on the program, but well, there's a lot of support elements to support this program as well. Um, for everything from the Europeans have got a bunch of money, but, you know, but also universities and who are going to counting on it to do their own own research and if the thing doesn't get up there it makes it a lot harder to make it go there's no danger of it not happening um i um <laughs> never, say no. never say never would be a good answer you know i i would say that I've, I've seen other programs that they spent a lot on that didn't go anywhere i i doubt it at this point because they have a an artifact that's been built as opposed to still building things or testing, th it's really in the t and the testing is is going fairly well. It's just that they want it perfect. They don't want it close. They want it perfect because the thing gets out there, you know, quarter million, qu quarter of a million miles away and doesn't function. You're down completely. There's no fix, no fix within any type of reasonableness that so we. So the can. instrument is exists. No, oh, it does exist very much so. And there's engineering models to Goddard if you want to go see them, but but the the real flight artifact does exist, and it's been been moved around several times, and they're they're still just trying to make sure it's going to work in all the ways that they envision it. But it's still got a ways to go. It's got to get to the launch site and get there and get to the uh, and get uh, the, the but uh, so and again, we have bigger boosters now. This has been sort of discussed. We didn't have really big boosters when this started. We have bigger boosters now. Uh, the Falcon Heavy would be another way you could get it up if you wanted to. But again, change the money, change the building, change the change the adaptation, change the fairings. 
Yeah, you could. How much money did you say I had? You know, so yes. So th so they're going down a road that should have been, that hopefully it would have been executed mm, at least seven years ago, <laughs> five, seven years ago. And it's going to be two or three more years in the future if everything goes right. I, I think, um, I, I don't, th this is a considered a crown jewel type project. I don't think they're going to walk away from it. In, anything else? Any other non-controversial objects? No. Um, any, in, any other uh, things going on? The, um, as, as I was telling the midshipmen last night, this is really an exciting time to be alive. There are tons of things that are happening. And a lot of things that we thought we knew, of course, turning out not to be so, not so clear, not as exactly what we thought. It's a great time to really be paying attention to a lot of this stuff because as we get out, really get out of the, off the planet and start finding a lot more things that have not been as nearly clear. Uh, one of them was saying last night, well, isn't it, is, is, do you think we're going to go to Mars? Well, yeah, I think we're going to go to Mars. I think we're going to go to the moon and Mars because, again, there's a whole lot of, of impetus to not only go there, but we're learning so much more. One of the other programs we talk about a lot are the various Martian programs, because JPL owns all the rovers, as well as the satellites that are in orbit around Mars, as well as the communication. So the new, there's a new mission that's going to be launching on May 5th. May 5th is called InSight. So InSight's going to go to Mars and do something we are all very curious about, uh, what's going on t uh, within the geological structure of Mars. It, it would help characterize a lot of things if we understood it a lot better. But it's going to do something else that's kind of neat. It's going to launch from the West Coast. On first, uh, first opening is May 5th. First launch, planetary launch ever from the West Coast. Um, it's, everyone's encouraged to come to it, strangely enough, at Vandenberg, which is normally a high security area. But anyway, it can, can come. But I think they really want you to stand outside the gate and watch it go. Um, and, but the other thing about it is that it's going to be the first deployment of CubeSats. So going back to that communications issue. Cassini recently was taken out of commission on September 15th and burned up in, in orbit and they had all these reasons about why we had to burn it up into Saturn. Well, one of the fundamental ones is we were out of bandwidth in communications. It, it eats up a lot of communications to talk to things that far distant that is generating that much information. And Juno had just come online in orbit around Jupiter and now we got some other missions heading out, especially the ones going to Mars, that one going to Mars. As, and, and as well as uh, we're gonna, if James, uh, James E. West was at one point in part of that, but also so when we get tests up uh, into a position, that also will be generating data. And all of that stuff has to be managed by the Deep Space Network, which are three 70-meter 70, 70 telescopes that are around the world with a whole bunch of supplementals that other people contribute to it. But that's the primary way you talk to things outside of Earth orbit. And, if, and so there is a limitation. But going back to, back to InSight, InSight's going to have two CubeSats. The first two CubeSats deployed in another planet's orbit and they're deploying them specifically for the idea of being able to create a communications network which is what you'll probably be hearing a lot more there's a lot of talk about doing a communications network around the moon why are you going to do that well so people and vehicles can go there more frequently and communicate because we have a real limitation in communicating even with something 270,000 miles away on average that's only two or three seconds by communication it's still a communications issue so there's a lot of things that, that are that w people talk about why does it take so long to do stuff it's far away a we don't have great technology to get places but communication is part of the problem as well and so there's a number of things going on to try to solve some of those fundamental issues about getting there when test i was going to say uh insight launches may 5th it gets there november 26th yes sir are any of those satellites going to use laser communications no but they're still trying to do that and they've been doing that at, at iss and have been doing a laser program laser thing you know laser is really neat in that you can get a whole lot of information in a, in a coherent wavelength transmission Finding each other is not nearly as easy as it sounds. You know, it, it sounds good, but it's shooting big things, shooting a little thing against a really, oh, across a big distance, uh, it turns out the things are really small. It's, they, various laser programs have been discussed, tried out, even at relatively short ranges, it's hard to always get them, hit them. And so there, they are. That that is in the that's in the the discussion. The, one of the midshipmen says, "So how many of these things are going on?" NASA currently has 62 missions, projects, programs operational in the systems. So there's a whole lot of things going on. A lot of them are orbiting Earth, looking down. We have the Terra satellites and all the various things that are going on. 
New Horizons will be the big program on January 1st of this year when it arrives at, uh, if I say this right, it's 214MU69. Of course, there's a mouthful, but actually what it is is another Kuiper Belt object. Beyond New Horizons with the mission that went to Pluto, it's going to go to another one. And so, and I probably should just put this out because maybe I, um, I assumed something here. So, because it was a big surprise to some of them last night. We really talk about the solar system in three different um, t three different groups right now. We have, of course, the rocky planets and the gas uh, giants, but after that you actually have the Kuiper Belt. There are thousands, as in maybe tens of thousands of objects the size of Pluto or larger floating around in the Kuiper Belt. So the, most of the solar system we haven't even touched. The big planets on the inside um, are probably massively outweighed by the ones on the outside. And we're just now beginning that conversation. And that's part of the conversation that came about with Kepler is when we were looking at other, 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 uh, other systems, you started seeing some of this stuff going on around other ones. But it's still a fascinating thing going on. There's so much more out there going on. And I'm sure you'll be hearing more about the third division of the solar system. That's one way it's talked about. The third division where all the, a lot of the action is going to be. And you'll hear about it New Year's um, for sure. Uh, Over talked my time? No. Oh, oh, okay. Um, any other questions? Well, again, I would encourage you to, so we, we do, and I guess I should have done the uh, other commercial. So we also do the tours of the Naval Observatory. If you don't have an, haven't been to the Naval Observatory, I would encourage you to go. We're sort of in a security hiatus, but we're going to go, the, we'll probably be starting the public tours up this summer again. Um, it, it, and it's really not that big a deal. It's, it has to do with a game of how many, how, many, how many volunteers can we get to escort people is really the bigger problem. But, but anyway, we're going to be doing more public tours in the relatively near future. But if you've never done the Naval Observatory, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, so go on, well, on just good USNO tours. USNO tours, type it into Google, it'll, it'll bring it up. You can see that, and that, that's a pretty neat thing to, to take a look at. But there are a lot of opportunities in the Washington area. Um, Novak, of course, has, has plenty and supports lots of them. And, uh, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at what's, what's out here, because uh, it comes up all the time, not only at the, mu at the museums, though the other one I was, my wife was halfway reminding me. So if you have, maybe not for yourselves, but maybe for that group that was here before, we do sleepovers at the Smithsonian Museum. So our first one is May 11th at American History. And we do it throughout the summer. Do it at Udvar Hazy, and we also do it at Natural History. And so if you've, and, and I'm saying it to y'all, because guess what? The children can't come without an adult person. <laughs> And uh, so as I say to them all the time as they're running around, where, where did your adult unit go? So you can't run ahead of them. You have to keep them in, in sight at least. So, but we have 10 different, different activities at each of the different um, museums. And they, they spend the night. I don't spend the night anymore. They spend the night, but, it, but it's, uh, we, we stay till 11. But for four hours, they're running around the museums doing various things associated with the museum. One of the typical ones we do is the Meteorite Hall and Natural History. They say, who wants to go to Mars? And show them the Martian rock that you can, can touch and talk to. And uh, as well as all the various iron uh, nickel uh, meteorites that we have. But uh, American history will be, we're doing a lot of physics type things. We'll be in the, I think we're in electricity this time. But there's a number of physics type things that we do with them as well as more, uh, more you know, how does a locomotive work or, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you build a telescope? There's actually a several telescopes there in American history as well. And Udvar Hazy, we're normally at the Discovery, on the, right in front of the Discovery shuttle and doing the various programs around that, around that which amazingly enough, they spend most of their time looking at all the displays and not so much doing the various activities activities but they have a big time doing that it's a very big thing if you haven't been if you're not aware of it we have people come in from Singapore China uh, Russia Europe all the time saying I'm gonna do all of the museums that have sleepovers and almost every major museum in the world now has some degree of a sleepover program so it's something else to look at and get exposed to another another part of all this exciting stuff that's going on well I appreciate your time and if there's no more questions and I'll give it back to David thank, thank you, you.